Coming up on uh, Tuesday, April the 18th at the Thornbury Picture House in the season of Unknown Pleasures screenings of films is Peter Tammer's uh, film Journey to the End of Night, a 1982 documentary and in fact a high definition uh, restoration will be screened at the Thornbury Picture House. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking to Bill Masoulis, who's the co-creator, um, uh, co yes, co-director, uh, co-creator of uh, Unknown Pleasures with uh, Chris Laskery. Thanks, Peter. And Peter Tammer, who's the director of Journey to the End of Night. Welcome to Movie Metropolis. Well, I've been with you before, but it was audio and I didn't have to see my ugly face <laughs> up on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we had talked previously, but that's we won't. Uh, might have been about that flowers. No, Poles Apart, when I, when I put out the e-book Poles Apart. Uh, yes. Long time ago, Peter. It, I think it it's was. about four it years was. or five years ago. Yes, but I remember it uh, quite well now. That's right, exactly. All right, but we're here to talk about Journey to the End of Night. So, uh, Peter, first question to you. Um, how did you first get to know about Bill Neve and have him as the subject of your documentary? Okay, that's easy to answer. Um, I was... Uh, I, I was living in a boarding house at one stage in between jobs and things like that. My life was, my film life was pretty wretched at the time. And uh, a friend of mine, Ruben Moe, his, his surname is Mazowski. In those days, he went by the shortened version M-O-W. Anyhow, he put a, a newspaper article under my door one Saturday night or Sunday morning when I woke up there was this newspaper article which included all of Bill's story. And it was written by um, a Herald Sun journalist, I think his name in memory is Robert Coleman. And, uh, and it was like a two page spread from the Saturday Night Herald's, uh, you know, the Weekend Herald. And it was extraordinary. And so Ruben invited me to be a partner in making a film with him. And he researched the film and got to know Bill and introduced me to Bill. But then sometime later, Reuben had a terrible car accident and he was in hospital for quite a while and, uh, and recovering for a very slow recovery for many months. And I think Bill Neve got very upset that nothing was happening with the film. And Reuben's plan was to make a conventional feature film. And of course that needed a lot of funding and all that sort of stuff. And Bill Neve had no understanding of that. And so he was very frustrated that nothing seemed to be happening. Anyhow, one day, Ruben rang me up and uh, said, look, I can't go ahead with the film. I, it, it, during this period of recovery, I just, I just can't face it anymore. You know, would you like to take it over? And I said, yes, but I can't take it over in the style to which you've been writing a feature script and all this and going through fund applications and getting rebuffs and, and being told by panels how bad the script is and what you've got to do and all this. And I was going through my nightmare with Malakuta Stampede, not getting finishing funding at the time. And I said to him, look, I would love to take it on, but it would have to be a different sort of film that I could make on my own terms. And he said, fine, I'm happy with that. So he said he'd bring up Bill and tell him that he couldn't continue and that Peter would take it over. Now, Bill had already met me a couple of times through Ruben. Uh, so um, then, then I got Bill to visit me up in Hawthorne where I was teaching at Swinburne and living around the corner from there. <clears throat> and we hit it off pretty well. And I showed him a couple of my early films that were like His Dear Mr. Robinson and A Woman of Our Time, and he loved those. And he said, our film's going to be much better. <laughs> so I was up to a good start, right? <laughs> That's so, how it all came about. What an interesting background to uh, to make you making that film. That is uh, so interesting. I, I had no idea about that uh, that situation. Well, I haven't told many people about that, Peter, you know. Ah. And, you know, we're talking 1978 and 9. Yeah. 79 yep. and 80. I was actually starting. I was actually starting the production of Journey to the End of Night my way, while I was finishing Malakuta Stampede in the editing room. Okay, what a juggle! Okay, it was a big juggle, and I was very broke at the time because Malakuta stumped me. I was. I, I ran out of all my available funds. Journey was made on bank card. 
Wow. Sure. <laughs> so uh, tell me about filming Bill, because obviously he was keen to be filmed and talk about his uh, um, experiences in uh, Papua New Guinea. Um, he was more than uh, keen. He was obsessed by it. You know, you've got to remember that um, I had a big start on this because I knew that he was going through it in his mind every day and every night. Uh, he was never getting away uh, from it. It's not something he would, you know, he would get a reprieve when he was busy with other people about an activity. But uh, when he was on his own, he was in that world. Now, uh, there's another background, uh, another background to it yeah. that you should know, and I haven't told many people this, but it is in the, the notes from those days when it was on at the film festival and everything. Um, that Connie, who's his wife in the film, is his second wife. His first wife had died, and Connie, who's in the film Journey to the End of Night, and Bill knew each other from their adolescence, right? And uh, at some point, uh, his first wife wouldn't let him talk about his, his military experience. Mm -hmm. So his World War II experience was banned in the house, and he only ever got to talk about it with other people when they all got drunk on Anzac Day down at the pub and stuff after the Anzac meetings. Yeah. And he, I don't think he even shared it with his children and that. So the in the film, you'll see Connie and Bill Sr. with Bill Jr., who uh, they're talking about the quality of the cooking and they're talking about backing horses and that sort of stuff. That's his son, his eldest son. Yeah. And his eldest yeah. son didn't know anything about this stuff until he saw my film. Yeah. <laughs> he only found out about it through the film. Wow. And they were, he and his sister were very proud that I'd made the film for their dad. So, you see, does that help you? Absolutely. So, so tell me about your process of filming, because I got the impression you used more than, more than one camera. Um, no, it's only one camera. Only one camera. Ah. So, wait, wait, when I say it was never more than one camera at any time. Yeah, yeah. I had yeah, a number yeah. of, I owned a number of cameras in those days, which I used to have in a hiring company, and they were available to me whenever they were not being hired. Now, I went down with one camera one day to test Bill on this film, and the camera broke down halfway through a magazine of film. But guess what? I came home as happy as a lark because I knew it was going to work. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was right in there from the beginning, and, so and I went and, down and shot a four hundred foot test, ten minutes. It yeah. broke down at the five minute mark, jammed in the camera for no good reason, and I came home knowing it's all going to work without uh, processing. Yeah. The reason I asked that question, that is, again, that's so interesting to hear all this uh, this process stuff, is that he doesn't look at the camera, um, and I gather he didn't need much prompting because at times it looked like that you were toggling between different scenes. Yes, I, I did that deliberately. You know what? Uh, I used to let the uh, even though I, I uh, even though I was broke, I bought film. I bought film at a very reduced price, like a third of new price, because it was outdated newsreels film from a newsreel cameraman in Sydney. Yeah. And so I got I got $60 rolls of film for $20. Yeah. And and therefore, and because I was only processing it, not work printing it, I thought, well, we'll just shoot the film and we'll, we'll process it and see what we do with it later. So I never really had to do much stop start with him because I treated the film like once we were running, it was running like water. You know, you'd like you turn on the tap and it's running and then with film, you run out of film and you stop, you know, uh, in those days. Now, of course, nowadays, if you're shooting with a GoPro or something like that, you can run an hour of film through the camera without running out for that hour. You might run out of battery power, but you're not running out of film. And it's not costing you like it cost us in film days, you see. So then there's the other thing. Um, I, I, from the very beginning, I, I directly, I didn't consider this as a, as a directorial thing, I just chose to have him talking off camera and not at the camera. In it, all the sequences in the film, I never asked him to look at the camera mm. because it just seemed alien to me, mm. you know? And also, um, Adrian has pointed out in his comments that, uh, that, you know, that I often cut between one sequence of Bill doing something and another sequence that are not necessarily related. And I do that because I didn't want it to be just a, a, a chronological continuum. 
Does that make any sense to you? Yes. I, I don't know why I had that to say. You know, another thing about this sort of interviewing is if you'd have asked me these questions in 1982, I could have given you more accurate answers. But 41 years later, I can only say, I don't actually think I thought about that very much. Uh -huh. I okay. think it was, you know, I've, most of my life I've been an intuitive filmmaker. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't follow, okay. I don't follow, <laughs> I might have been a film teacher, but I don't follow rules on how you make films. <laughs> Good on you. That's fine. Bill, do you want to, to uh, chime in here and say something about that? Uh, well, well, it's interesting with the, um, you know, point of view that Bill has that, that um, he does not look at the camera and, and that's, that's perfectly um, uh, per perfect, actually. It's because it's kind of like he's, reliving you know moments and it's like he's looking at you know one of his um kind of you know um, army mates or then someone else over here and 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 of course if you're looking at the camera it means you're you're addressing the the viewer and you're offering the story um in the past tense and whereas bill is actually living it moment by moment he's in the present. Um, he's in the present. yeah mm. oh, he sometimes is in past tense for example, he goes into some things where he's talking to one character about something that's happened before. Mm. Mm. You know, like he talks, he he talks to his the, the departed friend George mm. about what it was like when they were be, before they went to the war, and mm. how they used mm. to practice shooting together. And you were a much better shot than me, George. You know, you you know that sort of thing. And anyhow. So here's another one for you, Peter, following the theme that you've just raised. I always knew deep down in my, my, my psyche that Bill was trapped in that zone and couldn't get out of it. And I knew that he was not doing that out loud every day, but it was his inner voice always going, right? He's, he was always addressing these things to himself. Mm -hmm. So all I had to do was to encourage him to go back into a particular moment that I knew about and get him started. And so I'll give you a good example of that. There's a sequence in the film that I'm incredibly proud about, and that's where he sits at the piano and starts playing Oh Danny Boy. Yep. And I knew he wanted to do that as a tribute to George. But I, I, we didn't discuss it very much except to say, Bill, after lunch we're going to do Danny Boy, right? And so after lunch, he came out and we, we were having lunch together. We came out into the living room and I showed him how to pick out a few notes on the piano for O oh Danny Boy. And I had the camera ready to go, had the lights set up, had the exposure. I had everything ready to go, the sound recording. I had no crew, right? Everything was set up, ready to go. And he starts playing those few notes and then he starts and he goes through a whole roll of film like that. I didn't have to do any directing on that. Yeah. All I had to do was ask him to sit at that at that piano in that approximate frame and mm. pick out those notes, and I had allowed enough space that he might lean back during the shot and stuff, which he did. Mm. Amazing. It was that simple. Yeah. Now, yeah. there's an opposite one, which I can talk about, where we did have problems. There's one that... Um, the last sequence in the film, which is so powerful, on the night that I shot that, I had a terrible ordeal because I shot four magazines of film and they were all approximately 10-minute takes. Now, if you don't do a 10-minute take, you just empty the, you know, you, 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 you take the film out of the magazine and put it in a can, maybe for processing, question mark, and those first three takes were terrible. He wasn't in the zone. Uh -huh. So I had to stop and have a talk to him and we had a cup of tea. It was an evening shoot, like a Sunday evening, the end of the weekend that I was down there because I did a lot of this on weekends and holidays. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I had to level with him and I knew he was distressed about going through the start, but I had to tell him it wasn't working. And he didn't understand. I said... Look, Bill, I know you're upset. I know, I know it's upsetting you when you do this, but you're not in the same space you are when you're in other takes. And it's not working. So because he's not an actor, what the hell does that mean? Mm. He's got no actor's training. So what does that mean to him? 
Well, we went out after the cup of tea and it turned on. And I could hardly look through the viewfinder. I was holding back from breaking. Wow. What do you do wow. with that? How do you how do you explain that? The first three takes I wasn't moved at all. Mm. But it was astonishing when he got there. Yes. Exactly. So exactly. my my job wasn't to tell him how to do it, but to mm. tell him when it worked or when it didn't work. Right. But right. you know, I also I don't have a very big experience of working with actors in my life. I've never had the sort of directorial experience that many other people who direct actors in dramatized films from you know scripts that are written by script writers and they deal with actors and and the actors know their craft and the director is is not actually teaching them their craft. Mm. But I'm I, I'm also not trying to teach Bill his craft. I'm just trying to draw something out that I know is there. Does that make sense? Does that, am I making sense? Absolutely. No, I absolutely understand that process, and uh, which intrigues me. I, I mean, I've got a number of questions to ask, and I'm looking at time. How did Bill respond when he saw the final version of the film? Well, he saw it in a couple of stages. I, I took it down to him once when I had it on what you would call a double header. Ah. And I I put that onto a VHS tape and took it down to him and showed it to him and Connie one night in their living room on their TV just to say, this is what I've got to so far. How do you like it? And he was incredibly, they were both really, really thrilled with it. Yeah. So then he got to see it at another stage, which is when I got a release print that I made a, re a final release print. And that would have been about six months after that VHS screening, right? Mm. And mm. it was now getting to the point where we could enter it in the Melbourne Film Festival and things like that. So mm. we're now into 1982, the beginning of 82. Mm. And I had also arranged a screening at the State Film Centre for invited friends, right? Friends and friends of mine that were filmmakers and just, and relatives and things like was that. And Bill could have his relatives there too. So, you know, but, so it was a screening for about 100 people at the State Film Centre at the beginning of 1982, before the film festival screening. Uh -huh. And that uh -huh. was very successful. And, uh, I, um, and, and Bill really responded very, very well to all the people that he didn't know coming up to him and congratulating him for making the film. And he, you know, that was very big for him. The people that were absolute strangers were coming up and saying, good on you, mate. Thank you for making this film. And, you know, even in his hometown, when I showed the film at the drive-in down there after all the film festival stuff was over, we went to the drive-in and the drive-in was packed out. And then a few days later, Bill told me people were stopping him in the street. And one person stopped him in the chemist shop to say how wonderful the film was and how good he was for making it. No one ever, no one ever took him to task about what he'd done that caused him to make the film. They were congratulating him for having the courage to do it, to say, this is what I did. Hmm. This is what happened to me. So it was very powerful. But on the other hand, now, the other thing is people talk about was it cathartic for him, you know. Mm. So, And it was cathartic for him. I know that. But he never, I can promise you this, I kept up with him till he died, right? Uh, he died about 10 years after we finished filming. Mm -hmm. In 1982, we showed it at the festival. He died about 10 years after that, nine or 10 years after that. And I was down at Caston the, the, the week that he died and he was incomp, he was burbling. He was not. He was barely conscious. Mm -hmm. And I know he was still trying to thank me for making the film, you know. He never got it that it was not my film, you know, that it was a partnership that couldn't be made by one person, you know. Mm -hmm. But he, he, even if I would say that to him, he wouldn't take it on that level. He would say, you know, thank you so much for making the film, you know. Um, and I believe that he, I don't believe he ever forgave himself. Not, not for the saying things about the film, but for what he did that led mm. him to be in that crisis. Yes. He didn't believe he could be forgiven. 
Yeah. I can't. Yeah. He says in that, that final take, to God, I know you can't forgive me. I mean, which is an absolute anathema to any Christian. <laughs> <laughs> Dear God, I know you can't forgive me. So uh, just on that, uh, you, uh, you, there are some passages from the Bible in the film, as well as from uh, Louis uh, Ferdinand Celine, I think. Celine. Uh, uh, Celine. Celine. Uh, Celine. Yeah. Tell me about putting those in. How did that work? Well, it, it came out, the, I'm very pleased about this. It's a m most amazing synchronicity that happened to me around about the time I finished Melakuta and was working on Journey and I hadn't finished Journey. Around about that time, two books were loaned to me. One of them was a, re, a revised translation of the book of Job in modern English rather than biblical St. King James English, mm -hmm. right? Like our, let's say the Church of England Bible uh, that people would read if they were Church of England followers was written in 1600 or thereabouts yeah. under James I or something like that. So the, the version that I got was a, a completely new translation that was loaned to me, right, on the book of Job. And the second one was another friend, Anne, Anne Wookie, who was... Part, uh, who was Nigel Buston and Anne were a, a team at that time, partners at that time. She knew I liked um, Celine's death on the instalment plan. So she loaned me Voyage au bout de la nuit. And oh, I couldn't believe it, but the conjunction of these two things was while I was editing the film. And I felt like they bookended. They bookended Bill's experience, but they put his experience into a sort of um, a juxtaposition with each other and him. So he's in his zone. The Bible is giving you another, another way of looking at how humans have related to moral crises and, uh, and, and the issue of fate and what, what fate delivers to you, what is put on your plate that you have to deal with. And Celine is not religious. He's an atheist. And, and he says, we're living in a shithole. And uh, we can't lie about this. It's terrible. And if you do something terrible, you must admit it. And he was one of the biggest fascists in France at the time. And he was considered by all the lefties like Sartre and Camus and everybody the biggest traitor of France, you see. Ah. But, he, but people like... They all respected him for the intensity of his writing and the clarity of his writing. They just didn't like his politics. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Does so, that help? Uh, so, Bill... Does, does that uh, answer your question? It does. Of course it does. <laughs> so, Bill, let me ask you about the restoration of the film that you're screening on the 18th of April at the Thornbury Picture House. Ah, well, the restoration, yeah, we've, we've actually been screening a few restorations by Ray Argel um, in Sydney, who's doing super, you know, top-notch kind of work on restoring from the original negative. Uh, I mean, in this case with Peter's film, Peter has done the restoration himself ah. and uh, using a, a particular, and this is really great because I, I say to a lot of filmmakers, don't wait for the archive to, to offer you a restoration. Mm. Do it yourselves if you can. Even if you have to uh, spend, you know, a bit of money on, you know, going back to the original neg and doing a, a new digitization. Uh, yeah. But Peter didn't do anything like that. He just actually worked with what he had, like the, a DVD quality or, or a bit better quality. Uh, oh, I started with the DVD file. Yeah, yeah. I've done and it then from he, I so it's basically, yeah, I mean, you can speak for yourself too, Peter, but it's just like a, a, a program that cost a few hundred dollars and yeah. um, it actually gives pretty good results um, for, for that amount of money, certainly. Mm. Well, if I'd have done it, the, Peter, if I'd have done it the way I've done some of my earlier films, like the ones I made in the 60s and that, I would have taken them to somewhere like um, Callum's Memory Lab and had him copy the 16 mil original on his digitizing telecine machine and getting it up to 4K. But I didn't do that with Journey to the End of Night because I can't afford that. That's a very large amount of money would be required to do a film of that length. So what I did is I 
but a couple of uh, I've been experimenting with Topaz, and Topaz is a, a an AI uh, video enhance system, and the problem is it is very powerful, and sometimes you're tempted to take it further than you should, and then it breaks up into artifacts. So I'll give you one example. In one film that I was restoring, there was a bit of sunlight on a man's nose, and it looks like he's got this big band-aid on his nose because the AI doesn't know what to do with this little flash of sunlight on his nose. Mm. So it turns it into something that looks like a patch, mm. and it looks like a plasticky patch rather than just natural sunlight falling on someone's face does. So, you know, so you've got to learn how to use the the equipment or the program so that you don't push it too far. And at first, I, w I kept making the mistake of pushing it too far. And I, I finally, uh, after a number of attempts, I found I could get a certain result that was not perfect, but that it was so much better than anything I had on the DVD. And I, I wouldn't have wanted to present the DVD at the screening on Tuesday week. Mm. Okay. No, no, it's, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, well done, Peter, because like I said, it's just like a few hundred dollars for this program as opposed to spending thousands um, doing it, you know, the kind of the, the proper way with the original NEG. So, and yeah, it just gives that sharpness. And so it's really great in that regard. And um, detail. It, it, it brings up detail as well as giving you the sharpness. Sometimes mm -hmm. it does too much, but we won't, We can talk about that. I don't want it to degenerate. You know, the film doesn't deserve to be talked about on technicalities. Yeah. I, I, I think, I think I'd think i like to just chime in. I mean, yes. we've been talking about Bill Nave, the person and everything, but we, I don't think we've even mentioned what, what he is and what it's about. It, it's about the horrors of war and mm -hmm. it's about trauma um suffered in war and of course the 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 what's known as these days the PTSD mm. um uh, afterwards and and I think in that regard it's really really groundbreaking I think at the time it would have been quite astonishing and and when you look at the film now it's it's got this particular uh, depth and in intensity to it that you feel like it really is his soul exposed and he really mm. is saying everything he's he's telling these great kind of deep truths about his life and 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 life in general so it's just a remarkable film in in that way yes and one two, I can, two awards yeah let me take yeah. up a point with bill there there was something that happened shortly after the film was first released and i'm now talking about when it was shown at the film festival and that mm. and i was approached by someone who must have been a psychiatrist at the time, and he was running um, stuff for Vietnam. Uh, mm -hmm. People returned from the Vietnam War with trauma. Yeah. And, and, and so he asked, could he show the film to the people that he was treating? And I loaned him the film and he showed it to them. I never had further contact right. with him, but that's an example, you know. Mm. Um, and another one, one other little story, which I know you'll love, we, when we showed it at the Metro Melbourne at the Melbourne Film Festival that year, um, in the foyer uh, upstairs after the uh, in the lounge upstairs after the uh, screening and the people were having drinks and all that sort of stuff, these two women came up to me and Bill, and and Connie was with us. So and these two women did I didn't know who they were at first. They were let's say I would I was in my I was about forty at the time. And these women would have been in their 60s. And they they revealed themselves as being the wives of two um, ex-diggers. And one of them was Bruce Ruxton, yeah. who was famous yeah. throughout Victoria um, for being the, the, the bulldog of the, uh, the Veterans Association. You know? yeah. And they came up to me and they said, and Bill, and they said, all the boys must see this film. Yeah. All, all yeah. the boys must see this film. Amazing. So there you go. 
what can yep. I say? Before? Okay, my Zoom is rapidly running out. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, look, congratulations on the film. It's obviously a natural selection bill for uh, unknown pleasures. And of course, you and uh, Peter will be there at the screening. Um, yes. Uh, on the mm. 18th, which is uh, terrific. It's always good to have these uh, Q&As, uh, screenings and Q&As. And uh, look, congratulations on the film, uh, Peter. And uh, uh, it's uh, going to be interesting for you to hear, I suppose, the reaction from uh, a contemporary audience. Yes, I'll tell you this. I, I am much more interested now to hear what new people who've never seen it before think. Mm. Mm. Because mm. I know that people, like people who have seen it in the past, remember it well. But I want to know what it's like for, for new people. Mm. Mm. Fresh Excellent. people. Mm. Exactly. Well, Fresh I viewers. Okay. <laughs> well, I hope it all goes well. Uh, on the 18th, we've been speaking to Peter Tammer, the director of Journey to the End of Night, and to Bill Masoulis, co-curator of Unknown Pleasures, film screening Tuesday, April 18th, at the Thornbury Picture House. Thank you so much uh, for talking with me. No, thank you for doing this. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Thanks. Peter. All the best. Okay. Ciao, ciao. Okay. Bye. Bye. See you later. Bye.